that's when you had the opportunity to say that Ahmad, that you're going to be my pet and I was like I don't understand he said you'll be my pet wherever I'm traveling to you travel with me whatever extra favors you need you could always come to me and all that For many decades, the journalism profession has been hailed as the watchdog of society, thrust with the responsibility of making the government accountable for every action it takes, which include government decision-making processes, corruption, illegal activities, financial mismanagement, environmental degradation, consumer protection issues. It is indeed undeniable that the media globally has made giant strides in making not just the government accountable, but also to educate the public on government policies and programs. The parliament is on recess and many of the lawmakers have retired to their country home. They would rather not comment on the issue of the day. One thing that is certain that they will not forget in a hurry is the legacy she left behind. Particularly her passion for Nigerian states. But as journalists ensure on a daily basis that the government is accountable, who holds them accountable for their own actions? What is good for the goose is good for the gander, they say. In this documentary, a thorough look will be taken into the sexual harassment of female journalists in newsrooms or media houses, and if effective sexual harassment policies are being enforced and implemented to curb sexual harassment. I am Tsimi Tsokwe Ululeye. The press also needs to be held accountable as well for shortcomings within its internal structure. Mrs. Muturayo Alaka, the CEO and Executive Officer of the Wale Shoinka Center for Investigative Journalism, speaks of the need for the media to be more accountable. You know, generally the media, not just in Nigeria, but the media globally, does not talk enough about its own challenges. We are used to holding government and other authorities accountable. We are not used to being accountable and the more we embrace accountability the more we're able to have truthful conversations about such things as sexual harassment that is that they are actually the cases are many in our newsroom the press needs to be called to order regarding the prevalence in the sexual harassment of women in newsrooms UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Dovbraka Simonovic, in her 2020 report to the Human Rights Council on Violence Against Women, its causes and consequences highlighted the increase in gender-based violence against women journalists, threats and sexual violence faced by media workers and harassment in the workplace. According to a 2013 study by the International Women's Media Foundation, Almost two-thirds have been sexually harassed or abused on the job. The study also found that harassment ranged from verbal abuse to intimidation and physical violence. And most women never discussed what happened. A survey of sexual harassment in eight African countries carried out by the World Association of News Publishers the WNIFRA Women in News, together with the City University of London, has revealed a shocking statistic. One in every two women working in the media sector has experienced some form of sexual harassment. Rachel Ambaka is a Kenyan female journalist who has been using her voice to campaign against sexual harassment in newsrooms after she experienced being sexually harassed herself. She didn't only take a bold step to confront her boss, who sent her a lewd text, but also reported him to the human resources manager of her newsroom. She says that sexual harassment is almost never spoken about in newsrooms, yet the media is central in highlighting the plight of victims and survivors in any society. 
Rachel Ambaka claims that sexual harassment in newsrooms silences the voices of people who would otherwise have remained confident. The rampant nature of sexual harassment in African media houses resulted in the Time's Up Afri Media campaign against sexual harassment in media houses in Africa in 2019. To those men in newsrooms who are huggers, gropers, forceful kisses, lewd jokers, one message. Time's up! EAA Media Productions with Rachel Ombaka. In partnership with African Women in Media, AWIM. The Media Council of Kenya. Biola Alabi Media. Presents, presents Time's, Time's Up Afri Media. 16 Days of Activism. A multimedia campaign. Video. Twitter chats. Panel discussions. Radio shows. Ghana. Nigeria. Kenya. Time's, Time's Up Afri, Afri Media. Media. Our newsrooms, our media houses in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Kenya. It could be one of those African nations. But will it be one of those days? Walk into a newsroom or a media house. It's the morning. You've barely had breakfast. And this happens. You, you have, have a, a one of four, four moments. moments. It could be your colleague, your boss, your fellow journalist. Let's break it all the way down. Four scenarios, sexual harassment, in newsrooms and media houses in Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. The tight hugger. The tight hug you don't want. Your breasts are flattened against his chest. His crotch is in between your thighs. The hug goes on and on. Incidences of female journalists being sexually harassed on the job occurs in Nigeria as well. Kate talks about what she encountered when she went for a job interview. Okay, the first form of sexual harassment that I've experienced as a journalist was when I went to, after I'd passed an interview before my induction, the managing director told me to my face, okay, I was at the office with another lady that was supposed to resume that same day. And he sent the lady to go get someone for him or to call someone to come over to his office. That was when he had the opportunity to say that Ahmad, that you're going to be my pet. And I was like, I don't understand. He said, you'll be my pet wherever I'm traveling to, you travel with me. Whatever extra favors you need, you could always come to me and all that. And I told him, no, so I'm not that kind of a person. I'm not interested in gaining extra favors and traveling with you if it's official i could go but if it's unofficial i'm not interested it really made me feel terrible and i figured that was a red flag because i wouldn't be able to excel and thrive in such environments like why do i have to be your pet am i an animal like i don't get it and it actually made me think okay or have a rethink to know if I really wanted this job or I have to learn some extra skill on emotional intelligence and how to deal with such people which is really bad and sad and basically that's been my experience. In the article titled Newsroom Need the Me Too Movement, Sexism and the Press in Kenya, South Africa and Nigeria, a survey by Blumel and Malupi indicates that in Nigeria, 38.1% of women experience newsroom sexual harassment compared to men, which is 10%. It also showed that sexual harassment in the newsroom has resulted in women journalists feeling intimidated and discouraged. It also emphasized that issues of sexual harassment are hidden and are treated as an issue that women journalists should resolve on their own. Mrs. Moturayo Alaka, the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of the Wale Shoenka Center for Investigative Journalism, confirms the rampancy of sexual harassment of female journalists in newsrooms and media houses. What I have heard from many 
ladies that I have trained, that I've come in contact with, that I've mentored, is that the answer is yes. So while I do not have um, a survey or an investigation, an inquiry into it personally, we've had talks and um, for instance for a set of this reports women program that we had in the class more than half of the class raised their hands when I asked a question about sexual harassment and if they had experienced it in their newsroom and there are also stories that many of them told you know and people corroborated the trends in newsroom as to how female persons are harassed or are told that they cannot go further in their career except they settle with their bodies so i have a feeling that it is a lot more much more than we talk about mr lekon otufoduri a veteran journalist and media career development specialist shares his thoughts on the issue of sexual harassment in the media well I can say that I hear stories and I also know that things happen. You know, I remember um, I was one day, I mean, very illustrative. But normally, when we are leaving the office, we drive, I drive with some staff and uh, we are just talking. I said, because that time I was working in the nation, but I'd worked in Punch 14 years before. I said, ah, things have changed in the media. We don't hear stories about a newsroom, harassment, and people. I want you to say, editor, you are a journalist for Christ. If I tell you what happened in the newsroom, you ask me to rewind, <laughs> you know? So it happens. Uh, there are indirect intimidation. But what you have not had is somebody actually speaking up, you know? You've had, I mean, I even remember a story where one lady, she used to be an intern where I used to work. Then years later, she started working. She now met an editor who once tried to harass her. And she was well, she was like, thankful I didn't give in. Imagine what would you be like meeting her. So there have been instances like that. I also remember a case, an intern who was, I mean, she was uh, working with me. So there was an opera. And she was like, yeah, this person is trying to harass me. They are making man. And I said, and I said, ah, why did you tell me? Said, ah. I said, okay, even if you can't tell me, why don't you tell this person? Ah, this person too was also interested. So, in between harassment and uh, what you call newsroom relationship, was well, sometimes about taking advantage. And unfortunately, sometimes even interns are hard. Even to though see. some female journalists were reluctant to share their stories of sexual harassment with, with me, I was still able to find a couple of female journalists from different media houses in Nigeria who were willing to speak up and share their sexual harassment experiences with me. Chinyere, at a first job at a media station in Kwara State, faced a lot of harsh treatment, unwarranted queries from her media boss when she refused his advances. So yeah, um, at my first place of actually working ever, I... The first place she ever worked at? Yeah, the first place I, I ever worked as a female journalist. Okay. Um, I had, there was this particular guy that was very stubborn and it was my boss. And, you know, he was always saying random stuff. So there was this particular training that I went for and on my way back from the training he was chatting up and was saying like we should meet up at the hotel that there's an assignment that we have to do tonight and I'm like okay whatever assignment it is we can do it at the station my gate is always open you know my dad really doesn't mind if you have to work late you will understand so they don't lock the gate when once you get home just knock and then they will open the gate for you he was like, no, is that something we can do? We can finish up early. I already knew where I was going to, so I didn't drag it. I just said, okay. And when I got to Ilorin, I didn't tell him I was already in town. I just went on straight. I mean, you can't punish me for something like that. So when I got back to the station the following day, of course, the normal attitude for you not dancing to get tuned was there. And I mean, I, didn't, I don't really care because I was doing my job and I was, I was really focusing on my stuff. So it became um, really annoying when I had to start working overtime because I didn't dance to his tune. And you knew obviously <coughs> that was really dancing. Yeah, obviously. We were like um, in the department, there were other people. And then he got involved with some other people, right? And then those people were, we were taking the same salary. We were like, 
the same level at work and then they have to work lesser time than I do. I, some days I go six days in a week. Normally I'm not supposed to work for more than four days since there are so many of us that can share the, um, the workload. I do six days in out of seven days. At the time, there was a time I, why I even really got angry was I did nights a night a day before, and then the next the next day I was on afternoon. If you do now, you're supposed to be off duty the next day. That's the normal thing. So I got home and then I I left the station around nine because I had to wait for them to do the normal thing and then go back home. And I had to go back to the station by twelve because that's where we resume afternoon. And it was really it was really sad because I'm like the only thing I didn't do was dance to your tune. You told me to meet you up somewhere. I told you clearly I can't come. And then you were saying, you know, it's work. I didn't argue with you because I know clearly what you want to do. So I just left and just went to my own house. And that was the beginning of the problem. And also, Titilayo, a seasoned broadcast journalist, had personally experienced several sexual harassment incidences at work and claimed that her refusal to agree to harassers' unwanted demands for sexual favors resulted in her not being promoted deliberately at work. Okay, so I started off very excited when my first job came. A few weeks after service, I got my first job in Lagos with a leading radio station then to do news reading. And so I worked in the news department and worked closely with the deputy head of news who was meant to put me through, learning the rules of how to write news, edit news, which wasn't strange to me though, but then trying to learn the production side of things and so we got working so weeks into the job i got a note from him with my seat was just close to his and so he slipped the note into my hands and i opened it and what i saw was let's go to the penthouse and have sex it was very direct and so i looked at him and i wrote a big no and the next thing was slipping a note back okay if you are uncomfortable doing it here we can go to a hotel and after work we can go to a hotel i thought it was a joke and first of all what came to mind was what even gives this guy the audacity to ask me this? So am I giving him any green light? I shouldn't think of that because I'm a very serious person. So on the job, I get extremely serious with my job. And um, I really don't give room for things like that. I don't know what would have made him think that. I wanted it. <laughs> but it wasn't funny. And so because I said a big no, in the aftermath of that, I saw a friction between, uh, between us. Just to say that those you know, relief, you know, coming in and then seeing someone who's also from your state because you're from the same state and sometimes you even get to speak our language once in a while. I saw a situation where I would have a big brother. I wanted to take him as a big brother, as someone who would have my back, watch my back because he, I thought I had a brother and that wasn't the case. Okay, away from that one, there was the editor, a senior editor in the newsroom who one day just walked up to me in the newsroom and said he wanted to see me. And so I stepped out. I was wondering what he wanted to see me for, but you could see how serious they, I want to see you all. So I went to him and the next thing he said was, please, can you make me come? Can I make you come? What did you say? He said he had not had sex for weeks. His wife has refused to give him sex because she's angry with him and he's very full. He needs to release. Can I just massage his penis uh, until he comes? Or can I just do something to make him calm, please? Wow. That was very direct as well. And I didn't find it funny, so I told him no. And sorry excuse me <laughs> and i walked away and as i was walking away he was still begging i just left him there but for this one he's a very shy guy so for days he couldn't look me in the eye you know he was extremely he felt extremely bad he had to ask in the first place and so it was fine no was no and we moved on Another one, not in my department now, in the programs department, that gone to take the news on this particular day, walked into the studio and he had to pick up something from the news department. So I was heading back to the newsroom and the guy just came up from the production studio because we're just a glass demarcation both studios and everything happened so fast. So what I saw next was his deep just popped open and his penis was out and he was laughing. I didn't find it funny. I ran, picked up what I wanted to pick, and I came back, and he 
all through the period I was taking my knees, I was at the production studio looking through the glass and having fun. For weeks, for months, I didn't talk to him. We never spoke. I was angry. I told him I did not like that. It wasn't something to laugh over. It wasn't funny. You know, so going back to the first story I told you about my deputy head of news, I never really thought that saying a big no to him and sticking to that all through the while I worked there for five years, that he took it personal. So years after, I moved from that station to another station, and when the station opened in another location, another state, and I joined them, and I had to work under him again, but now as my head of news. And trust me, I never suspected that, because I felt that that was years back, and we both, you know, moved from being single to getting married, so he was married, he was more responsible, I thought, and so what I saw happen all the period I worked under him for over four years was a boss who stifled me, a boss who made sure that I did not progress on the job, a boss who made sure that what I wanted to do beyond just being a desk editor was go on the field. He never allowed me get any assignment. As much as I walk to his office and say, hey, you know, I'm also a field person. I like to be on the field as well. I like to do some of this assignment, so let it happen. He made sure that he stifled me on the job. And I understand that intentionally, this guy made sure that I did not grow on the job. And I would say that he really did make my career progress slow. He did. And I did not see it. And why am I saying that I know he intentionally stifled me was because he told me to my face one day, not once, he, has said, he said it up to three times, I remember, that I'm very stingy. And you would think that someone saying you're stingy possibly means that, you know, you don't, you're not really dealing with money or stuff. He was specific that I just like to keep my vagina to myself. Priscilla, during the course of attending a media-related program, was dumbfounded when she was inappropriately touched by a facilitator. Um, for instance, I was in Ghana for a program, and um, I think one of the resource person, it wasn't really, it was more like this um, unsolicited, um, touchy kind of a thing. I'm like, hi, how are you doing? And then, and it's quite intrusive because it's not something you asked for, but it's someone rubbing up your shoulder and stuff like that. So I think that was, that's the one that stand out for me so far. How did it make you feel? Well, I was pissed. I was going to, I was going to hit him, but I, when it happened, I, I was taken aback because I was surprised. I didn't expect something like that to happen in that kind of formal setting also. And considering that he was an elderly person, he was quite nasty and surprisingly I was disappointed. So it made me feel disappointed. And because I know he's a father, should be a father, definitely, probably a grandfather. So it was, it was, it was crazy. Though cases of sexual harassment still persists in newsrooms, there are national and international policies framework in place to protect female journalists from sexual harassment. One of such is Article 18, subsection C of the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on Rights of Women in Africa, adopted on the 1st of July 2003, which states ensure transparency in recruitment promotion and dismissal of women, and combat and punish sexual harassment in the workplace. The Maputo Protocol, as um, I think most of us know, uh, deals with the rights of women in a way that is specific to the African context. Sexual harassment is a form of gender-based violence, and the 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which is adopted by Nigeria, calls upon governments to take action to address several critical areas of concern, including violence against women. The Platform for Action states, violence against women is an obstacle to the achievement of the objectives of equality, 
development and peace. Violence against women both violates and impairs or nullifies the enjoyment by women of their human rights and fundamental freedoms. The truth is that most women around the world work both inside and outside the home, usually by necessity. We need to understand there is no one formula for how women should lead our lives. That is why we must respect the choices that each woman makes for herself and her family. Every woman deserves the chance to realize her own God-given potential. But we must recognize that women will never gain full dignity until their human rights are respected and protected. UN Special Rapporteur Simonovic makes reference to the UN Plan of Action on the safety journalists and the issue of impunity, developed in 2012 at UNESCO's initiative. She recommends that the implementation of the UN Plan be fathered through a UN system-wide coordinated approach to combating and preventing violence against women journalists involving the special rapporteurs on violence against women and on freedom of expression and the platform of United Nations and regional independent expert mechanisms on ending discrimination and violence against women. The effective implementation of the VAT Act means improving access to justice for survivors of violence, providing voice for every voiceless Nigerian who have suffered violence in one way or another. In Nigeria, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, VAP Act, was enacted into law in 2015. The act was passed into law in a bid to eliminate violence in private and public life, prohibit all forms of violence, including physical, sexual, psychological, domestic, harmful traditional practices, discrimination against persons, and to provide maximum protection and effective remedies for victims and punishment of offenders. 16 states in Nigeria have passed the VAP Act. Anne McFighton, an associate professor of strategic management at the University of Texas at Arlington, states that sexual harassment can cause depression, anxiety, and stress. And in most severe cases, the victims can suffer flashbacks, panic attacks, develop a substance abuse problem, or attempt suicide. So why do cases of sexual harassment still occur in newsrooms or media houses? Do newsrooms or media houses have effective and stringent policies in place to curb sexual harassment? And is it being implemented? Mr. Shegwadiniji, the general manager of Women's Radio, WFM 91.7, Arikbo, Ogun State in Nigeria, the first female-oriented radio station in sub-Saharan Africa, shares the policies put in place at Women's Radio to curb sexual harassment and how it's been implemented. This is my 26 years in broadcasting and still going on. Uh, before now, I've been in uh, Inspiration FM as uh, Deputy General Manager, Head of Programs, Head of Content and Head of Strategy. And shortly after that, I was also the pioneering GM of Sobi 101.9 FM in Ilori. Um In the last 26 years of my career, Cases of sexual harassment are not new, they are rampant, just like in every other industry or sector of uh, um, human endeavor. Now, in the broadcast space, and particularly in my present organization, we handle cases of sexual harassment first by asking whomsoever alleges such things to first of all prove the insistence on, of proof is to give fair hearing and to have evidences that such thing exists. And where such allegations have been proven, the offending staff, based on company policy that exists in my station, that offending staff will be summarily dismissed. I repeat, that offending staff will be summarily dismissed. There is no 
um, cover up there is no second uh, thought there is no waiver nothing it is instant and summary dismissal that is what the company policy states and it is being applied and is applicable where such cases are proven there are policies that have been put in place where i am women radio and the policies are derived from the contents of the staff handbook that clearly states uh, some of these things that i mentioned earlier like um, instant dismissal to proven cases of uh, sexual harassment and Part of the policy is not only on sexual harassment because something must have started and must have led to um, issue of sexual harassment. For instance, uh, bullying, for instance, um, um, uh, violent attacks or whatever, or mouth slinging or allegations or uh, improper use of certain words in the workplace env environment, as well as improper dressing or you could, you could call it provocative dressing and other things that could lead to some other things that would now could now escalate into these forms of allegations or acts now there are policies that guide every such move every such aspect now these policies are clearly stated well made well known to staff made available sometimes they are publicly published at strategic locations leading to different parts of the offices so that they become conspicuous they are not hidden aside the fact that new members of staff that are being recruited part of your induction you will be shown all of these things and you will be shown all the company policies so they are made known to every member of staff coming in as new entrants or new staff and they are also being published at conspicuous places like I mentioned earlier secondly they are always being implemented and we've had cases where some members of staff uh, have had to be disciplined based on the volume or value or rate of the offenses in line with company policy and of course some have all, all already been told that if found guilty over such allegations they would be asked to leave to the organization if those allegations are proven so these policies are well implemented they are available made available publicized and implemented to the latter without any forms of uh, waiver or, or dilution or reconsideration or whatever there is no such continuous orientation and having policies against sexual harassment that conforms with global standards is how anita eboipe the managing editor of human angle in abuja says her media organization prevents incidences of such Unfortunately, uh, I haven't had any any case. We haven't had any case in our organization, you know, about um, sexual harassment. And the the reason is quite straightforward, really. Uh, from day one, we made it very clear that um, sexual harassment is a no go area. We have had a policy since we started and we have had several orientation programs over and over just to refresh you know the memories of others and there are various um the various other ways that we have put plans in place to mitigate against this for instance um after the orientation there's also a um a, a committee that you can report to um blindly you know anonymously you don't have to you don't have to be there physically so all of this to avoid victimization stigma and all of that um that being said i'm aware that this is a very privileged ideal situation and that it's not what is normally obtainable i have had to also work in places where certain forms of sexual harassment were seen as normal you know and um it was seen as something that um, women in journalism had to endure really that yeah, come on why would you be angry that somebody's calling you a name or touching you in certain places and, and and the interesting thing about the way that it works is that it's not just in the newsrooms it's uh, also in the activities that you do that concern the newsrooms like going out for assignments um, going to interview sources and just have people who have this stereotypical idea that um, female journalists are 
are promiscuous or something and that uh, the fact that i'm trying to interview you is a call is a call to treat so there, there has always been that um i feel seeing how much you know this having a sexual harassment policy and a committee and um, having orientations as regularly as possible seeing how it has helped my organization i i recommend really uh, because what it does is that it it helps for everybody to have a very decent flow of communication and for people to know that there are boundaries and then you have to respect other people and that um, both for male and female really that they are just certain things that you can't get away with you know because you feel it, it, it comes with the territory. According to Mr. Idowu Adekunle, the station manager of Royal FM 95.1 Ilari, committees will be constituted and investigations done if claims of sexual harassment arises. Uh, for my for the records and in my experience as uh, HR person, manager, and now the station manager. I have not come across uh, any sexual harassment in the workspace that we work uh, for the past 10 years. I haven't had such complaint, uh, but uh, I won't say there might not be, but officially none has been reported. So we had no case of sexual harassment within our work office. When it comes to policies being put in place to guide against such occurrences, does your station have that in place? Oh, definitely, yes. Definitely, yes. Every, every corporate organization should have that uh, because you must guide against things like this. Of course, you're bringing in different people from different backgrounds and ideologies of life. So the perspective of everybody is different to to our approach of life. So definitely all of those things must be incorporated into the policies of every organization. And ours is not different. We have that in place. Uh, to my best understanding, looking at the uh, policies, if such happens and it's been reported, uh, of course, it's a confidential issue. Uh, it's not something that will make open to everybody in the workspace or in the work office, in the office. We'll make it as confidential as possible. Uh, we set up committees to investigate uh, differently from both parties. And if the either party is found culpable and uh, uh, sure that this actually happened, uh, definitely is uh, the first thing that happens is uh, disciplinary measures come into place uh, that can range from suspension to outright dismissal. Uh, that's how important uh, we place we place premium on, on such cases because we want people to have liberty of life, expression and freedom in the work office. So uh, if such is reported and is being investigated and people are found uh, culpable of it, it ranges from, the penalties ranges from suspension and if it's a grievous one, it might uh, lead to uh, total dismissal or even persecution by the law enforcement agencies. So is there anything that is being done on a regular basis to ensure that the staff are aware of these policies and... I would say at first, at the entrance level, everybody is given the handbook, to, so everybody have a copy of the handbook either electronically or at, at copy. Everybody is entitled to one, which we do uh, for every entry level person into the organization. And as a case may require, we have trainings and we have retrainings on a regular basis. It might be quarterly, it might be yearly. Once in a while, we do such uh, cases. But of the truth, I will not say we've had this specific issue treated or reminded 
oftentimes maybe because we don't have such occurrences but with this we might want to look at it again and say okay maybe in one of our retrainings or seminars or workshops you might want to bring it up just to refresh people's memory about it what about the regulatory bodies or stations of the Nigerian press or media NGOs? Do they have laid down policies or programs to curb sexual harassment in newsrooms? Are those policies being actively implemented or are cases of sexual harassment taken leniently or ignored? I had a discussion with the Choir State Council Chairman of the Nigerian Union of Journalists, NUJ, Mr. Abdul Latif Ahmed, concerning this. And he mentioned that the Nigerian Union of Journalists is currently undergoing a constitution review. NUJ National Headquarters uh, put in place uh, a few days ago, on Monday, set up uh, a committee on constitutional review. Uh, you know, the, the review of the constitution of the union, which is the guiding uh, principle of the of the of the union and today the committee the committee on constitutional review has requested a memorandum uh, from councils across the country and doing that uh, we'll be able to uh, through that constitutional review some of these issues will be mentioned because uh, uh, the constitution must envisage uh, those uh, challenges if they are not uh, factoring or they are not mentioned in the existing constitution in the, or in the extant laws. So when you have that in place, I'm sure uh, the, 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 the issue of uh, sexual harassment in the nation or in the media industry uh, definitely will also be raised and uh, it will definitely form some of the, uh, some of the opinions, some of the views that will be put uh, before the uh, Constitutional Review Committee, which I believe will definitely form uh, the document, uh, which is a form of report that will be submitted to the National Headquarters for consideration and approval at the appropriate time. Dr. Yemisi Bangboye, the Executive Secretary of the Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria, speaks further on laws or policies guiding the broadcast media in Nigeria regarding sexual harassment. There is no specific law. Uh, in most organizations uh, as uh, the issue of sexual harassment but there are um, rules and general laws that are applicable uh, to many of the stations most especially government owned stations there are rules there are regulations uh, that guide relationship uh, between uh, subordinates and um, subordinates relationship that uh, I mean um, rules uh, that guides uh, even relationship uh, between workers either in the newsroom or within the premises of the organization and um, since the uh, issue of sexual harassment has been brought to the front burner due to a lot of um, uh, unfortunate um, incidents that have been happening in many other sectors you'll see that uh, there have been no report to the best of my knowledge uh, as to any serious uh, issue of sexual harassment in any of the media organizations but i know that in terms of editorial policy in terms of relationship with workers, uh, there are policies, there are rules uh, that specify uh, the relationship. Uh, I know from the level of bond, uh, people have been admonished uh, to know that one, if you work in the media, in most cases you have the name and you have the integrity and you shouldn't allow uh, any primordial thing to rubbish the name that you have gather together that God has helped you to gather together uh, many years back. Mrs. Muturayo Alaka, the CEO and Executive Director of the Wale Shoinka Center for Investigative Journalism, reveals a unique program they created to engage the management of media houses and canvas for the inclusion of sexual harassment policies. 
Okay, so we have something that we called house to house, and that is engaging media houses, going from one media house to the other to engage management. And one of the things that we're encouraging is that media houses should have policies about sexual harassment and that they should be able to speak openly about it. Now, we are also aware that a number of media houses in Nigeria do have policies on sexual harassment, and a number of them actually take it up very seriously when there are cases of sexual harassment, whether by a male staff or by a female staff. They take it up and they act on it. So the more we are able to talk number one have conversations about the fact that this happens and that it is not then it is not normal because it is one thing to have conversations about them it's another thing to imagine that and to discuss them in such a way that makes others feel like this is normal like somebody eats me on the bomb like big deal it was just playing with you so except we have conversations that show that they are not normal and these conversations we must allow both male and female leaders of the newsroom lead the conversation so that it doesn't look like a discussion amongst these grown women because it doesn't also only happen to women there are male colleagues who are getting sexually harassed too although generally speaking you know the statistics about sexual harassment whether in newsroom or in other places is more about women so we need to talk about it we need to create policies but more than policies we also need to create practices and document practices because it is one thing to have a document that says there should be no sexual harassment and if there is one this is what will happen it is another thing to actually be in a newsroom where you are sure that if it happens something is going to be done about it sometimes people are quiet because they believe nothing will be done or they believe that they might end up being even more victimized for speaking out people get punished for saying their truth so we must document practices of people being held accountable and people being sanctioned for being people who harass others the more we do this and the more we talk about it and also the more media takes up the cases of sexual harassment generally in society and discusses them and you know uses that uses those ones to reflect upon you know themselves the more we are going to you know move further in settling the cases of sexual harassment in our newsrooms while some female journalists speak up confront and report those that sexually harass them at work a lot do not report they brush it off ignore and deal with it alone that is why numerous cases of sexual harassment in newsrooms or media houses go unreported and thus resulting in continuous occurrences because the culprits are not sanctioned or penalized. Newsrooms and media houses should ensure that reports of sexual harassment should be taken seriously and investigated regardless of the position of the people involved with penalties meted out to those guilty. Also, most female journalists that face sexual harassment in the newsrooms don't report such incidences because some might be afraid to lose their jobs, especially if the sexual harassment is coming from a superior staff or an immediate boss. If the immediate boss is the culprit, then who do they report to? Regular training on sexual harassment need to be held in newsrooms or media houses to curb incidences of such. Boundaries of what is and what is not sexual harassment needs to be established and stringent penalties need to be put in place and enforced to deter sexual harassment incidences. A sample of the sexual harassment policy by the International Labour Organization also stipulates that employees are to be trained every year on sexual harassment policies in the organization. Also, there should be a yearly report done by management on the compliance with such policies to evaluate its effectiveness. All these need to be put in place so that sexual harassment does not become a newsroom culture that becomes too difficult to eradicate. I am Timi Tokwe Ululeye. This documentary was produced by me with support from the Report Women Female Leadership Reporters Program Fellowship of the Wale Shrinka Center for Investigative Journalism.